announcement. I want to welcome everybody to um, stand up and get more pizza during the meeting. Uh, no problem at all. Um, I have a few announcements. The Eco Club this year is sponsoring the first uh, essay contest. Um, it's from uh, a thousand, you have to just submit an essay um, between a thousand and fifteen hundred words to Dr. D'Amico. And the topic is the current uh, um, factors leading to the current financial crisis. Um, just explain what you think led to the financial crisis. And uh, just, you can get, the first prize would get a thousand dollars. The second prize, five hundred dollars. So it's pretty easy money. Uh, I don't see why nobody, you know, would have the chance to participate. So just as a yes, as yes. So you, your likelihood to win, it's really high. So you should definitely submit the essay to Dr. Miko by April the twelfth, which is right after the um, Easter break. So you have time to think about it and push ideas down and get a perfect essay to Dr. Thousand dollars before or after taxes. Uh, well, you get a net a thousand dollars. How's that? Is it gold? Uh, no, not yet. We're working on it. Uh, well, and, and next uh, um, next weekend, March the 11th, I think, right, to the 14th. That weekend, we are going to uh, the Mississippi Institute at Auburn, Alabama, and you have the chance of um, being paid. Uh, you know, your hotel being paid. Um, your trip be, be paid. The only thing you have to do is sign up with Dr. Miko or Chris, uh, the guy operating on the camera. Uh, so you can just come and uh, it's the Austrian Scholars Conference and just talk about economics and Austrian school and uh, listen to kids. But um, I, I guess it's safe for announcements. Um, I have the blog. Um, I'm messing out this that Nick will start. And we have a blog set up in the newsletter. So just put down your email and uh, you'll get all the, um, the information and updates. <coughs> but now it's time to um, invite the guest speaker. Uh, today I'm honored to introduce uh, Dr. George Selgin. He is um, currently a professor of economics at the uh, University of Georgia and a uh, fellow at the Credit Institute. And he's definitely a uh, renowned uh, expert of uh, monetary uh, policy, uh, free banking, and uh, um, money. So let's uh, welcome Dr. Salji, who's going to talk about free banking. Thank you all very much. It's a pleasure to be here. I haven't been to New Orleans for quite a few years now, and it's nice to see that at least in this neighborhood, it looks as good as ever. I'm uh, a little bit uh, uh, apprehensive about uh, talking on the subject assigned to me for the simple reason, not that I don't know anything about it, but that I've been studying it for most of my professional career, and so I have to decide what aspects of it I should emphasize and which ones to leave out in the space of an hour and some change. So uh, I, hope, I hope I'm picking the right things to emphasize, but I also hope that uh, people will, that all of you will be uh, very willing to ask questions concerning the things that I appear to have left out. I don't want to leave any of you with uh, uh, the impression that there are some important parts of the topic that I've chosen to ignore because I have no good answers concerning them. Maybe I don't, but why don't you just go ahead and find out if you can. Uh, oops, wrong side. I'm going to start the way a lot of people like to start discussions of almost any economic topic, and that's by referring to Adam Smith. In this case, I have a particularly uh, important reason for going back to Adam Smith, which is simply that Adam Smith happened to uh, live in a society that had a free banking system, at least as close as there has ever been uh, an approximation to free banking. And Smith also had some very important things to say about the Scottish banking system, as well as about money and banking in general. So I want to start with the things that Smith noted about the capacity of the Scottish banking system to contribute to uh, the well-being of society. Now, let me just say that the, the Scottish system uh, was unique because unlike the English system, which I'll tell you a little bit about later, it did not have a monopoly bank of issue. That is, it did not award the privilege of issuing paper money to a single institution. Instead, although Scotland started with a monopoly, the Bank of Scotland, 
uh, shortly after the Bank of Scotland's establishment, a rival institution whose notes are shown here, or one of whose notes are shown here, the Royal Bank of Scotland was established. And eventually, <coughs> Scotland would have many competing note-issuing institutions. And this is one of the really crucial features, one of the unique features of a free banking <coughs> system. Not just that you have plenty of competing banks, why we have plenty of competing banks in the U.S. today and have had plenty for a long time, but that the banks are competing not only in supplying various kinds of deposits, but in supplying the circulating currency of the country. And so you had notes from a number of Scottish banks, ultimately a few dozen of them, that all circulated simultaneously. As you can see from this particular specimen, which is a late one from 1922, most of what I have to say about the Scottish system refers to its heyday, which is before 1845. The notes were denominated in standard units, here the British pound, which in those days were units of gold. But the main thing I wish to emphasize is that it was a competitive system. It was also a largely unregulated system. There were no <coughs> minimum reserve requirements. There were no restrictions on branch banking, such as were common in this country uh, until recently, fairly recently. There were no regulations on many other aspects of the banking business. No one told the banks what to invest in. No one told them uh, where they could uh, do business. The system was as free as any banking system ever has been. And yet it was also, by general, uh, uh, by, uh, general consensus, the best banking system the world had ever seen at the time, and maybe the best we've ever seen ever since. It was a very good banking system. Now, uh, here are some more notes from other Scottish banks. Smith emphasized a particular feature of the system that I would like to talk about, but I would also like to say this is not the most important benefit that the, or advantage that the Scottish system of free banking had to offer. He emphasized, again, its role in promoting economic development and economic growth. You know, at the beginning of the 18th century, Scotland was a very poor country, even by the standards of the day. In contrast, England was a very wealthy country, the most wealthy in the world, along perhaps with Holland. Yet by the end of the 18th century, in per capita income terms, Scotland had pretty much caught up with England. It was very close to having caught up. And according to Smith and other authorities since, much of this catching up had to do with the superiority of the Scottish banking system as an engine for harnessing scarce savings and applying them toward productive investment. Now, what you see here is a diagram that illustrates how the Scottish banking system promoted economic growth. And as you can see, it does so by harnessing savings from the public. Uh, and it does that by substituting the IOUs of the Scottish banks, including paper notes of the sort you just saw pictures of, for the other media of exchange people would otherwise have to use and would use mainly coins, including gold coins. Now, when people hold gold coins, they are engaged in a kind of investment of their savings, but it's investment in gold. It's not investment in any kinds of, uh, in other, any other uh, uh, activities, just gold production, gold mining. But by holding IOUs of banks, they allow the same funds, people allow the same funds to be lent by commercial banks. That is, if the banks hold a reserve ratio of 10%, 90% of the savings that they've acquired by having people hold their IOUs instead of coin are invested in various productive enterprises. Most of the investments of the Scottish Bank were to industri industries of different kinds. So that's supplying capital to firms, and that's ultimately increasing output and per capita income. Banks do the same thing today, of course, but are limited because they can't issue circulating IOUs. Only central banks do that, with a few exceptions, including, by the way, two Scottish banks that still issue notes today. And therefore, the only the savings that people hold by holding paper money all go to central banks. What's wrong with that? Central banks don't invest those savings very productively. They're very bad investors. It isn't even their job to be good investors. And so, to the extent that we save by holding currency, 